Well, hello everybody. Welcome to this live here, Climate Now Live on YouTube, where we are talking about the rollout of renewables. We're talking about the way that renewable energy is being deployed around Europe, and we're trying to understand the role of climate change as well, bringing in information about climate change into our planning for production of renewable energy and also deployment of it. And I'm joined by my guests here from all around the world. Just below me, you can see Claudia Kempfert, and she is the head of the Energy, Transportation and Environment Department at the German Institute for Economic Research, DRW in Berlin. Hello, Claudia. We have Hello. Jeff Hardy, who is a senior research fellow at the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and an Energy Futures Lab affiliate. Hi, Jeff. And Hi, everyone. Professor Alberto Trocoli, who's the Managing Director of the World Energy and Meteorology Council. Quickly, I'm here oh. at Euronews Paris HQ on the Champs-Élysées. Very nice place to be. Claudia, where are you? In Berlin, actually. I'm, I'm not at such a nice place as you, but um, actually, it, it's fine. <laughs> okay, Jeff? Uh, I'm at home in southeast London. Okay, and Alberto? I'm in one of the probably best place to, places to be at the moment in uh, Australia. Brisbane. It, so it's the winter time for you? It is, yes. Okay, it's so <laughs> well, confusingly, we're going to talk about the springtime in Europe, which you might not have experienced, but <laughs> the, the spring in Europe was a record breaker, right? It was really sunny. And surely that has to be good for solar energy, doesn't it? But I think, Jeff, you've got some, something to say about what we learned from the fact that it was really sunny, but didn't seem to necessarily help solar. Well, so it, it certainly was. And in fact, I think we've recorded it as the sunniest ray on record, May on record in the UK. Um, and it did mean there were lots of renewable um, electricity flowing around the system, lots of wind, lots of solar. But actually, it started to cause problems in the UK. So we had a situation whereby um, because things like solar power are basically seen by the electricity system as negative demand. Um, and what that meant was we saw the lowest daytime demand for electricity in the UK in May. And we saw it three times. And it was all around half of what you'd expect for a normal May. And that meant all sorts of issues and um, options were taken out by the system operator. And a lot of those things basically meant that the system operator turned off a whole load of renewables so all of these free power that's coming into the system were just turned off and not compensated. And at the same time, it turned on quite a lot of gas and it also turned off a large nuclear power station. So um, actually it kind of showed that we had the future in May this year, but we didn't have the future tools to deal with it, which meant we used very conventional tools and, and ended up turning off a lot of that free power. Isn't that extraordinary? And what do you make of that, Claudia? Well, uh, we have to take into account that the energy system needs to be uh, transformed and that means a priority to renewable energy and prepare also the grid and all the rest of the system so that we come not in the situation Jeff just reported that um, the, the uh, additional uh, electricity from renewables have to be phased out and we figured that also we experienced this in Germany as well at some time but now we are better prepared we are closing uh, nuclear power and in the next decade also coal and make uh, also the space for renewable energy because you need that and you need to transform especially the decentralized grid which is really important. Let's just bring up the graphic that we've got there down in the corner. Um, sunshine duration, we'll bring that full screen. You can basically see that it was incredibly sunny all across um, Europe. Uh, all this big band right across the, the heart of, of Europe was uh, what some places you can see over 100% more than what they would normally have in, in this relative anomaly map. It's just quite an extraordinary thing to me to imagine that we couldn't take advantage of this sunniness and grid seems to be the thing. The European Commissioner was talking about it uh, at the European Sustainable Energy Week this week, that, that grid across Europe kind of is, is, is got, kind of got a problem. Would one of you like to kind of explain to us a little bit what the grid problem is? I'm happy to make a start on that, if we like, and then others can please join in afterwards. So um, I guess that the, the problem we have in the UK in particular, and I know the UK best, is that we have... Um, a grid that is designed to be kind of run off a limited number of large power stations. I think it was originally designed around 38 power stations in the UK. Um, but now we've got more than a million um, 
kind of like much smaller plants like solar plants and that kind of thing around the system. So um, what we're looking to do in the future um, in this much more increasingly renewable system where the sun is shining or it's not or the wind is blowing or it's not is transition from a, a power system where the generation follows the demand to a power system where the demand follows the generation. And that's where we're a long way off because it's going to be a lot cheaper and you're going to build a smaller power system if you can activate all of us customers at the end of it, all of those businesses to follow when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining. So are you telling me that you're going to have a kind of a group WhatsApp for the entire United Kingdom that says put your washing machine on now because it's really lovely weather? Well, I, I don't. So I, I'm a complete geek and I do follow price signals. I'm on a half hourly settled tariff, all of that kind of thing. But actually, the majority of the UK consumers are not going to want to be that engaged. They're not engaged in energy at the moment. So one of the things that we talk about a lot in research and other things in the UK is finding that really happy place where a business can come along, take away some of that complexity from consumers, manage all of those risks on their behalf, because they're often better place to do it and still give customers a great service at the end of all of that and help them become more renewable, more net zero, all of that kind of thing. Um, but that's going to be really dependent on, you know, what the relationship between one customer and their business, what they want out of that. It won't be one size fits all. But what do you, what do the other two of you think about, about that? Well, I think it's exactly the point that we need a digitalization. We need more automatization for the whole system because the new system is more decentralized. You have solar, which is really not only to the people, but if you use solar also for industry, for example, you could use also batteries as a big storage option. But for this, you need a decentralized grid and you need all the facilities to, to allow that. And digitalization, as Jeff correctly mentioned, uh, you need some kind of system where you have this flexible prices or in a demand and energy demand uh, management system which which is automatically also balancing the supply and demand and obviously solar and wind has more volatilities as the conventional energy system and, and that means a full transformation i'm going to uh, take some take a couple of quest questions if i may sorry alberto do you want to go uh, jump in with something yeah, no, I was just going to mention that this is uh, obviously something that is uh, hit the, uh, with the solar in this instance, but uh, there are other similar effects that the climate has on, uh, on the energy systems. And, and this just shows that the system is changing, which is a good thing. And uh, we've seen also that in many places we can manage this uh, uh, high penetration of uh, renewable energy. And so it's not a problem, but it's important to realize also that it's critical in this instance to have a, a very, very good uh, forecasting system. And, uh, and the forecasting system is improving a lot uh, from uh, weather forecast to climate uh, prediction. So it's uh, something that uh, the scientific community has worked for, for a long time, but there's, there's been a kind of a disconnect also to an extent with the energy industry because it wasn't, the time wasn't ripe. And, and so now, now that uh, this is uh, becoming more urgent, the, uh, I, I think uh, the, the, the connection between uh, the science and the industry is, is closing in and, and I'm sure we can manage to also deal with a much higher percentage of renewables. Are you basically saying that the energy sector doesn't necessarily check anything more than the, the weather forecast for the next week or so, that they don't take into account climate trends on the longer term particularly? Well, yeah, that's that's one part part of the question, and that's uh, that's also understandable because the quality, of course, of looking uh, uh, a month in advance is not the same as looking a day in advance. But you can look at several other things. You can look at trends. You can look at, uh, you know, whether big signal, signals are coming, like a heat wave, for example. But the other part of the uh, story is also that, uh, you know, it's been uh, quite a, a long engagement with with the industry because. Uh, Science normally is a kind of a step ahead, like uh, in, in many ways. And uh, we've been talking with the industry for some time, but because the problem wasn't there, you know, the, the uh, percentage of solar power was like less than uh, 2% or 1%, they weren't worrying about. And then all of a sudden it picked up and they were not prepared. So that's, that's the situation, but it's not 
it's not a problem per se. It's just a question of organizing each other and being aware, being aware yes. of it. But, but also the business model have changed because in Germany we are now dealing with forty percent of electricity production coming from renewables, and sometime we have eighty or ninety-five or even one hundred. It's few hours. We already managed that, and it's working. So um, the, the business yeah. models have been changed since. It's last 20 years so exactly the the forecast as alberto said are taken into account and they can prepare on an hourly and really minute basis um what kind of volatilities they could they could balance so you've got that kind of system in germany which is the kind of thing that jeff was saying that the uk can't manage is that right well, uh, not yet because in germany we have uh, started 20 years ago with yeah. uh, with the uh, concrete promotion of renewables and started with two percent as alberto said uh, 20 years ago and now we have 40 and in a few hours even more and much more than this and now with the phase out of nuclear uh, we need to replace all the, the completely uh, conventional energy system and they are now preparing more and more and that is uh, what has been ongoing the last five years. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and take in some of the questions that we had from people on social media because you, you can send in questions, put them on uh, YouTube, send them in via the social media channels and uh, they should come through to me here. Uh, we had one um, about from uh, Paul Yella who was asking about hydrogen energy. What do we know about hydrogen? How does hydrogen fit into the kind of the future system for having a renewables heavy energy network? Discuss. Well, in, in Germany last week we have announced this hydrogen strategy. Uh, I mean, for those who are a little bit older, remember that in the 80s of the last century we already discussed about a hydrogen society, uh, uh, at least in Germany, but also in other countries like Japan, for example. Hydrogen is one important component uh, of a system with a full uh, renewable energy system because it's also you can produce hydrogen for those times where you have access of uh, renewable energy, and that will be uh, uh, also. Uh, uh, many, many hours and days of, of a year. Um, and we are starting with this program in Germany right now that we produce, uh, start to produce hydrogen from excess wind energy, for example. And it could be used as a fuel, not only as a storage option, but as a fuel um, for uh, some car parts of transportation, but also for the industry. We have a strong steel industry, for example, in Germany, which want to use green hydrogen. They are prepared. So it, it's a game changer right now. And I would say, uh, in contrast to, to 40 years ago, now we are really going into hydrogen at that moment. And it, 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 yeah. it's a similar picture in some ways with the UK. Um, and in fact, the moment we set a net zero target um, on climate change, um, we immediately came to that situation where hydrogen came straight back on the agenda. And the reason is there's no wriggle room in a zero target, zero carbon target. You have to take the emissions out of every single sector. And in fact, you might have to go negative in some sectors if others are very difficult to treat. Now, the, I think the thing that we haven't bottomed out in the UK is what is going to be the actual role of hydrogen in the economy? Is it going to be kind of completely replacing uh, methane in the national gas transmission system? Or is it going to be more kind of like region specific, you know, an industry cluster um, uses hydrogen and then that expands out to that particular reason, given a really good option? I think the key thing in all of this is that that hydrogen itself has to be zero carbon. At the moment, most hydrogen in the UK is made from methane. It has CO2 emissions, and that obviously doesn't wash in a zero carbon target. So it has to be, as Claudia has said, it has to be linked with renewables. It has to be driven by electrolysis or thermochemical processes, whatever it might be but it has to have zero carbon associated with it. That's very uh, important uh, to, to, to make it with renewables and not with, uh, with, with uh, natural gas or oil or, or coal. That would be the wrong direction. It seems like it's kind of a, a been on the agenda, like you said, for a very long time, something we've talked about. I think one of the first stories I made for Euronews as a science journalist 15 years ago was in a hydrogen car in Germany, and it was all, you know, the future, this was coming soon, and it hasn't happened. No. Why hasn't it happened? Have kind of lobbies stood in the way of it, or is it just technically too hard? 
to get it to work big scale? Well, especially in Germany, it does not make sense to, uh, to use um, fuel cell cars. It, it makes sense to use hydrogen or produce hydrogen with renewables, as Jeff said, and uh, use it uh, for those areas where you cannot uh, directly use the electricity of renewables um, directly, for example, in uh, electromobility or electric cars. And hydrogen needs to be produced. You need an extra infrastructure. It's not a, it's a wishful th uh, dream to think that we can just use uh, natural gas infrastructure infrastructure and, and hydrogen is a new gas or the new oil that will not happen. And this is the reason why, um, as you said, uh, there has been a lot of barriers in the past. So we do not have hydrogen to that large extent. But now as the share of renewable energy is increasing, we can and should produce uh, hydrogen and use it for those areas like industry or um, uh, heavy load uh, transportation uh, and uh, ships or planes. And, and that's all. I'm going to try and bring in one of the other um, graphics which we had, um, the third graphic that we had um, prepared, because it relates to one of the questions that I've had from uh, uh, Bruno Alves. He says, uh, what's responsible for taking it so long? I think he's talking about the rollout of renewables across Europe. And if we pull the graphic up full screen, we can see this is uh, uh, basically uh, projections for uh, renewable energy share over the uh, the, the coming decades. Uh, so right in the middle there we are around around 2019-2020. Um, we can see the split there. Uh, hydro still has a, a pretty ser seriously large chunk of it. Why is it that those numbers aren't higher actually? Because the, the technology works. Well, you still have market barriers in the system because now the system is based on conventional energy. It certainly depends on which country you're looking at. As uh, if we are looking at UK, you have a different picture um, because the coal phase out is already ready. In, in Germany, we are at the beginning of a coal phase out. In other countries, you already have a high share of renewables like Scandinavia or Austria and, uh, and the rest needs to uh, move forward. <clears throat> and that takes a lot of time, uh, but also to remove the barriers uh, that the uh, renewable energy system can come in. As Jeffrey at the beginning uh, reported from UK, uh, there are also difficulties related to the system. So you need to move step by step. Uh, but it's very difficult because there's a lot of lobbying also, uh, as, especially in Germany, um, that wanted to extend the lifetime of coal power plants as long as possible. And that hindered uh, a lot uh, the, the transformation towards a higher share of renewables. But I would say now we are on a better track, but uh, that is one part of the reason why we do not see the steep increase. But I'm very much convinced that, the, that we will reach a, 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 steeper, a steeper path in the near future. How far can we go with this? Uh, I mean, looking 2030, about 57%. Is, is that, can we dream any more than that? Or is really about that about it? Yeah, probably well, in not. In Germany, we, we, we not only dream, yeah. but we have the target to increase, uh, the, to increase the share uh, above, uh, above 60% by 2030. And that will, will be most likely. Um, but in Europe, we will see how fast the others are. But as soon as the cost of renewables are going down, down, down all the time, the battery uh, storage options uh, increase. Uh, a lot of people decide, um, as, at least in Germany, um, for more solar technology. So there is not a limit. It, but it all depends on the circumstances and the framework the countries offer. I want to talk about climate change a little bit because it is something that sort of, you know, we, we did talk about being something that would happen in the future. Now we feel like it is happening now, I suppose. Certainly the rise in temperatures is something people feel, uh, certainly people who are my age, feel that they've experienced. Um, w what does that actually mean for production and what does it mean for demand as well? Um, Alberto, maybe you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, so, so you, I mean, you observed the, the changes in the temperature. And, uh, and if you look at the graphs of temperature for, for Europe and many countries, uh, it's quite visible, the, the trend. Uh, for other variables like uh, precipitation, or wind speed and solar radiation is, is less marked. But uh, already, you know, the uh, energy companies are taking very close notice to these changes in temperature. It's not just a trend. As I said before, there are changes in, uh, in heat waves. So we're working closely with some energy companies to try to predict this at the range of uh, two or three months to anticipate uh, what could be spikes in uh, electricity demand. And, and, and then, uh, so, so people are monitoring and, uh, and modeling all these changes. 
Um, another interesting uh, trend that is uh, happening, like you also saw with the sunshine duration, is that or the sunshine over Europe is that uh, there's going to be this trend with uh, more sunshine uh, happening in the southern Europe and less in northern Europe. And, and that is going to affect, of course, the uh, production of solar power. Um, but, yes, we have a graph uh, for that. Which, uh, let's bring up that, that graph. We've got, uh, no, it's the second, the second one I'm thinking of. I'm talking here to my producer. Um, that we have a graph for, for sunshine kind of duration across Europe. You can basically see it, it, it's got sunnier, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sunnier. that's, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I haven't seen this graph before, but, uh, okay. and, and it, it should be checked because uh, sunshine duration is actually a, a, a something that is, not so easy to monitor and there's also the question of definition and so on but uh, I, I think this is in actually in in line with what uh, we are seeing in terms of uh, the you know this what i was saying about the southern europe having more sunshine uh, and the trend is going that direction in the northern europe and so because you have more sunshine hours in general in the southern europe that that will show up more strongly in, in right. the trend yeah and, and so yeah that's what but, seems to be happening. But, okay, but so in the future, if we're smart, will we in, be in a situation where we've got Southern Europe making amazing amounts of solar power and selling it and making loads of money, selling it to the Northern Europeans, and rebalancing the entire European economy? Unfortunately, there's a, there is a bit of a, <laughs> a little negative news there because uh, together with the increase in solar radiation in the south of Europe, there is also an increase in temperature and it, it seems that from uh, studies that have been done so far, the two compensate each other because the uh, temperature is going to affect the efficiency of the panels. And it, it, it's doing it in such a way that it's, it's more or less balancing the, uh, let's say, the benefit of uh, increased solar radiation for solar power. So at the moment, the projection is for a kind of flat line, roughly. That's interesting about the drop off in efficiency. There is not a way we can fix that by changing where we put our solar panels. Yeah. So I, I mean, go on, Albert. Jeff, Jeff, please, yes. No, you go. So, yes, there's, there's all sorts of um, technological um, fixes and optimizations you can do. You can water cool, you can kind of change materials, all sorts of things. Um, but I think what it also shows is, is perhaps two things. So, one is, energy systems have to adapt to climate change. You know, this is, it's inevitable. We're locked into a certain amount of climate change and it may get worse. And that tends to reflect itself in certain things like um, energy networks become a little bit less efficient, and lose more energy as you get hotter. Um, so we get more losses, you get issues with cooling thermal plants because the water they use to cool it from rivers and seas and that kind of thing is too hot. Um, but you also get uptick, so you might get stronger winds, you might get more sunny hours, all of that kind of thing that we're discussing at the moment. The other side, of, of course, is the mitigation of climate change. So the mitigation of climate change is exactly what we're talking about on electricity. Um, but the reason, another reason why that graph of 57% um, renewable electricity is not the full picture is because what we expect over the next 30 years or so as we head towards a zero carbon target is increasing electrification of some of those services in other sectors like heating in homes and businesses and transportation. So that means we're gonna demand more electricity over that time, um, which means that filling that demand, kind of like it, it's not that you're just getting 57% in the mix of renewables, you might be doubling or tripling the size of your electricity system in that time as well. Um, you mean and, overall energy demand going up? Oh, no. Electricity no, demand. Just yeah. electricity demand. Just exactly. electricity, because primary energy demand will substantially decline in the system with 100% of renewable, uh, because you're mo much more efficient if you use it efficiently and not produce hydrogen all the time, but uh, use electricity in electric cars, in the heat pumps, and what you said. I mean, and then we could uh, reduce the primary energy demand substantially, but the electricity demand will increase for those uh, for those areas, and this is why it's important to have as many as in installations as you can do in order to be prepared. I'm just, gonna... just really Go. quickly on top of that, it's, yeah. it's that really important point that Claudia made earlier about the digitalization and the flexibility yeah. of the energy electricity system. And all that really means is trying to build the smallest electricity system that is needed to mm -hmm. meet all of that new demand. That's all it means in, in 
kind of like general terms. And all that means is us as customers starting to follow the electricity when it's available. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a, a comment here from uh, Michael Moore. I don't know if it's the Michael Moore. Um, <laughs> um, he says that all, all renewables, apart from nuclear, depend on fossil fuels, i.e. you need solar panels are made out of carbon, biomass, burns, forest, solar compensates on gas. How do we move out of them? I, th I think he's meaning, is there, is, there an, is there anything else in our toolbox and there are any magic, magical cures for our energy needs or are really kind of solar, wind, bit of nuclear, bit of gas? Is that sort of really all we've got? We haven't got it, or is there something emerging that we should be talking about? Well, I, I think at the moment that's that's what it is. I mean, it's uh, it's it was uh, if it's the Michael Moore that that was a very interesting documentary indeed. But uh, uh, you know, it, it's it's he was raising a good point about the fact that uh, you know all uh, all sorts of uh, generation require some sort of uh, whether it's uh, rare earth materials or energy to produce them and and and, the, and therefore um, you know emissions. But if you look at the lifetime of uh, the different sources of energy, uh, it's it's uh, it's clear that solar is is way lower than uh, than uh, what is gas and coal, and at least ten times, and uh, wind is even lower. So um, nuclear also is low, but it's uh, it's a balance. You know, you have to uh, either you live with uh, with the current situation where you uh, emit a lot of. Uh, uh, gases that are not uh, are polluting, but also not very good for your health, and and uh, all the other consequences that we know, or you change a different future. So you know, it, it's the list of uh, we have to be balanced. It's not all about solar. It's not all about wind. Uh, it has to be balanced. But it's uh, it's pretty clear that uh, the new balance it's much more friendly, much more in balance with the environment than uh, the uh, use of fossil fuels. Now, there were, um, I would guess pros and cons to, and probably amongst your opinions, just amongst the people we've got here re re regarding nuclear, but does nuclear have to stay because it's low carbon and it offers a baseline? Do, is it have to be part of the system? Well, uh, the German perspective is clearly no, uh, and I, I think many other European countries would also agree, uh, because it's simply too costly. I mean, we have to spend so much money in order to invest in new nuclear power plants and um, uh, also the decommissioning and, and the waste. Uh, it, it's extremely costly, and we do not really need the base load. If we do it in the way we just discussed, we could have a system with 100% renewable energy and doing the, the balancing with digitalization, decentralized systems and we could meet all the demand energy demand we, we could we could do even without uh, nuclear because nuclear uh, is, is not really an, an economic solution I uh, just had a hello from Silvana Sil hi hello hello nice to say hello we like people sending us just saying a simple hello <laughs> we had a question from uh, Ishmael in, in Iraq who said how is Europe been benefiting from renewable energy actually I mean I think he's asking what's the point of this why are you actually doing it do we do we actually per se benefit from renewable energy it's yeah, a pretty sure fundamental question, right? Yeah, sure we do. I mean, well, uh, yes, we yes. invest into a new technology and uh, creating jobs, uh, value edits. Uh, we see that already in the German system. We have created almost, uh, um, I mean, 500,000 new jobs. And now we are losing a little bit because of competition. That is the one thing, the economic part of it. We are we do not need to import all the fossil fuels and the uranium we had in the previous uh, system. And of course, uh, we make uh, the whole uh, system less uh, vulnerable and more reliant and uh, uh, create the resistance of the full system and, and that's based on renewable energy. So we are avoiding a lot of uh, troubles uh, that we get from the fossil fuel wars all over the world. So uh, it, it's a good solution. It could help also in Iran everywhere, um, the, the system to stabilize and increase welfare. We had a, I had a little question from GVA de Mendez. I um, don't know if I've said your name properly, but anyway, that's what you wrote on Instagram. What are some of the affordable options for people living in developing countries? Because, we, yeah, we are in Europe. It's rich. We can kind of afford to make some, some of these expenditures. Are these technologies affordable for countries that don't have the, uh, such high kind of possibility to make capital investments? I, I think so. And in fact, um, so firstly, I guess there's been an awful lot of um, deployment um, all over the world, but, you know, in 
in, in a number of developed countries, which has really driven down the cost of things like solar panels, batteries, all sorts of things. So we're, we're seeing not only, um, you know, very, very cheap, if not the cheapest source of power um, coming through um, because of all of that development, but we're also um, learning a lot about things like microgrids. So there's a lot of countries that don't have a transmission grid and may actually never have one. Um, and there you can basically build a microgrid with solar panels and batteries and supply a community with electricity pretty reliably um, for not that much money. And there's loads of really interesting business models coming up around how that gets paid for, the services it represents and so forth. So I think that I think it is affordable technology and it is a way of leapfrogging, you know, potentially building a very large infrastructure um, and sinking a lot of money into that. Yeah, I mean, it, it may not be uh, always affordable for individuals in developing countries, of course, but uh, we also need to uh, note that there are uh, huge investments and at least there are available. There is the Green Climate Fund, uh, which makes uh, quite a lot of funds available for this type of activities. China is also investing a lot uh, in Africa. They, they're looking uh, at uh, big uh, hydropower plants, for example, the World Bank. So, it, you know, at the large scale, um, of course, uh, there are still some uh, uh, issues with pricing, but uh, with uh, the help and uh, the uh, this large funding organizations, uh, I think we are moving in the right direction. The European Commissioner, in, a, in her speech at European um, Sustainable Energy Week, was talking about the fact that you've got this uh, reduction in investment because the economy is kind of sunk this year because of the pandemic, but also an opportunity to restart. How do you see the picture in, from your respective points of view related to that? Is there going to be a change in the system? Or are we kind of going to back to normal and just kind of incremental change as we were? Well, it depends on which country you are looking at. And I could speak from the German perspective. Uh, clearly, we are <clears throat> investing also with a recovery package uh, into the green technologies. Uh, on the one hand, with electric uh, electric mobility, which uh, also the uh, the load infrastructure has increased and um, helping also to uh, increase the energy efficiency of buildings um, by also providing financial incentives and, and using heat pumps and all the rest. And we are moving forward to to increase the share of renewables so there is a there is a tendency also that some part of this uh, recovery package is going into this kind of transformation although other countries like South, South Korea or others are doing much more in this uh, respect but uh, in other European countries it's it's the same but if you're looking at other countries like USA or, or others it, it's it's a different picture but um, I would say uh, because of the uh, cost decline uh, there's no way out I mean there there will be uh, there will be an increase of renewables all over the world uh, because they are so much cheaper than than all the rest. Yeah, I, I mean, mean there's a, um, please. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. I mean, uh, I agree with uh, Claudia, but um, I, I mean, there is also the question of uh, um, you know the, it's it's a slow process uh, and uh, and adding this difficulty of uh, of the COVID and you know the borrowing that many governments have had to make to. Uh, front up the, the, the crisis, I think it's going to be very hard for some government to justify mm. the additional investment uh, for renewables right after the COVID. Um, what what the, uh, the, the crisis of COVID could have done is to, for people to realize that it's actually beneficial to live with a cleaner air, with a cleaner environment, and, uh, and that, that, that can uh, drive eventually. But it, I think people will expect uh, first uh, an economic recovery and then and then move towards uh, uh, speeding up the, uh, the the transition of the energy systems. Well, I think you could do both um, in one way because, of course, you have to look at the short-term impacts and help the economy and all the short-term negative impacts to really compensate that. But uh, if you spend the money and say, well, we have then some time to, to spend it in the future, I would recommend in doing both today. If you're spending money, mm -hmm. uh, then please don't spend it for past technologies like fossil fuels. Spend it for those uh, for the transformation. Has the, initiative, has the initiative of the Green Deal from uh, the mm. von der Leyen Commission, has that actually had an impact yet? Obviously, we talked about it a lot as journalists, and I guess that you talked about it a lot around the coffee machine, but has it sort of had an impact wider than that? 
Jeff, you wanted. I was going to come in on something else because uh, I'm mm -hmm. not that familiar with that particular point. All I was going to say in, is that in the UK, um, in the, the environment has never been a higher political issue. And therefore, all of the talk around post-COVID recovery is around a green stimulus. Obviously, there's lots of different flavours of that at the moment, but there's a real interest in how local renewables and energy systems could lead to a, a more resilient, more kind of like differentiated, you know, on, on, the, on the strengths and weaknesses of different regions in the UK recovery. And that, that's, that's such an important point at the moment about, um, you know, renewables tend to, particularly community and locally driven renewables, tend to capture more local benefits and more benefits bespoke to that particular place. And that, that could be a really important point um, in this recovery in that it allows different parts of the UK to recover as quickly as each other, but in different ways. Mm. And I think to answer your question, um, Jeremy, um, it's uh, I would say yes, that we, a Green New Deal has um, now the intention to drive this transformation towards a more greener, um, gre greener economy in the broader sense. Because if you're looking carefully on those um, stimulus or recovery packages, you see there's a lot of money going also into this uh, direction. Not all, because some is going to fossil fuel infrastructure. That's very strange, but uh, most of them is really directed uh, towards this. Uh, this green transformation and that's a good signal not only for this um, decentralized solar system because here also the rec recovery package of the green deal is very clear but also for other sectors for other areas like the mobility and electrification of uh, of the mobility system and i think that's that's going into the right direction i'm, I'm gonna wrap things up soon but i'm quite keen to talk about the the future really the future i mean all of the um, predictions that we have um, related to the climate, and I'm presenting data from the Copernicus Climate Change Service every month on, on Euronews, um, they are quite dire, and we see quite significant changes in terms of temperatures longer term. And there are questions about the resilience of the infrastructure and the systems that we're putting in place 20 or 30 years down the line. Does that go also for energy systems? Are they kind of what I'm trying to say is, I think literally technically going to be able to cope with the sort of demand you might have if you have some of the worst case scenarios in terms of uh, temperature rise and, and recurring and long lasting heat waves and things. So, I mean, we, we uh, first need to consider that the lifetime of energy systems is, is very long. So what we've done uh, 10, 20 years ago, we're not going to replace uh, all of a sudden. So we have to live with some of the systems for a while. But yes, you are, you're right that, uh, you know, particularly with all the uh, wealth of data that is coming out of the Copernicus Climate Change uh, Service and other data sets around the world, uh, you know, we, we're being able to pinpoint some facts like, uh, you know, the increased uh, uh, chances of heat waves, also more intense precipitations. And, and, and localized, so producing uh, uh, flash floods uh, or instead droughts because you got, uh, of course, uh, this uh, increased precipitation in some areas, but it's, uh, it's less in others. So this, this, all these events are happening. All these things, you can relate them to energy systems in many ways, uh, as you can think. Uh, and, and so um, the conversation is starting around now, like in the last few years, the conversation has started between, again, the climate scientists and, and the energy system planners. But uh, this will have, as I said, will have an effect on the systems that we are planning now. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's good because, I mean, obviously the, the, the uh, impacts are increasing and, uh, and, and, and uh, by the time the, the systems are built, they will be resilient, more resilient to the changes that we are expecting. But hopefully we won't get to that level because we can manage to, to turn down the curve of emissions and reduce what we expect of damages from the climate. But the time for action is now, really, on that, right? That's what everybody tells me. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, we need to act now yeah. and, and do what uh, Claudia was saying and, and Jeff, you know, it's uh, use the recovery funds to shift to, to uh, yeah, I mean, that, that a, a rapid and serious shift in order to cut emissions straight away. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah.
Well, perfect. I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you, everybody. It's been fascinating uh, on this Climate Now Live. And thank you, everybody who's been watching. Please send us your ideas for things you'd like to talk about. We'll be hosting these lives um, every month uh, for the rest of this year. So I'm going to say thank you to my guests, uh, Claudia Kempert and uh, Alberto Trockley and Jeff Hardy. It has been really fun. And uh, please yeah, send us your comments, your questions. And uh, Check out Climate Now on Euronews, where you can see all the latest climate data from the Copernicus Climate Change Service. And I'll see you next time.